Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by Simeon Morrow Public Speaking Presentations, Vienna Live with Simeon Morrow and other third parties. If you prefer to not be recorded, please turn off your camera and microphone and or go to the LinkedIn Live video feed, the link to which I'll now place in the chat room. For a better experience, please turn off your microphone and set your video to gallery view. This show thrives on participant contributions, and all participants are encouraged to actively participate in this webinar by asking questions and making comments. To do so, please either write in the chat room, raise your hand, or turn on your microphone and say hi, and I'll be delighted to include your perspective in the conversation. Tonight, our featured guest is Professor our featured guest is Professor Mikhail Verba, the solo bassoonist of the Vienna Philharmonic for about 40 years and for 12 years artistic director of the Vienna Philharmonic's Angelica Prokop Summer Academy Opera, and Professor Dr. Johannes Wildner, former violinist of the Vienna Philharmonic and currently professor of orchestral conducting at the University for Music and Performing Arts Vienna, and chief conductor of the Schunder Jelans Symphony Orchestra. We are also pleased to be joined by Professor Lino Rivera of St. Mary's College of California. And as I mentioned before, both of the professors uh, would very much like to speak to each of you if you have a comment or a question. So please feel free to interrupt. Welcome, Professor Verba. Hello. Nice to see you. Nice to see you all. Thank you for the invitation. Professor Verba, so tell us a little bit about where you come from and what music means to your family. Yes, it's a very special situation I was born in because I had two parents working on music. My father, uh, a very well-known pianist, specialist in lead interpretation, working with many singers over 40 years. Uh, and my mother singing at operetta uh, for at Baden, very, very uh, close to Vienna. I started uh, working uh, at the bassoon with 13 years, and it went so well that I could, uh, could join Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra with 20 years. Uh, you see my youth photos just now. That was the age I about this picture. <laughs> I that uh, is, you can, you can imagine, it was a terrible music family. Uh, with no uh, normal uh, schedule and only discussions about singers and music. That's my life. Fantastic. <laughs> Professor Wilsner, welcome. Well, thank you for having me here in this uh, wonderful group. And thank you all for being interested in Vienna. If I should describe my roots, it's not that um, exciting than uh, uh, Michael Weber's uh, history. I was born in the mountains about 150 kilometers south of Vienna. And I was brought up in a, a small family. I was the only kid, the only child, because my mother was not very healthy. Uh, and my father was a hobby viola player and a hobby violinist. And what I can say about my musical youth is my father brought me up with Josef Haydn. And I once in an interview uh, told uh, people uh, the music in the world began for my father, began with Josef Haydn and it ended with Josef Haydn. Uh, my father read this interview in the newspaper and he was very angry. You know, Why do you speak so badly about me? Also, Mozart was a good composer. Beethoven looked the whole life for compositions, but we also have to accept him. So now you know my roots. This is where I come from. And you should not think that this is the musical basement of Vienna, because don't forget, until about 100 years ago, 
Vienna was the musical innovation center of the world. Unfortunately, then historical things happened, which made uh, a destroying uh, procedure for these uh, circumstances. We will speak about this, I'm sure. Simeon will speak about that and also we all together. Uh, this is a pity, but we are coming back in an innovation stadium where we say music is driven by, uh, is, has an energy point coming out from Vienna. And I think we are very happy and proud about this. Fantastic. So Professor Verba, back to you. Tell us about when you're growing up, what it meant to go to the opera, what it meant to go to concerts. So clearly you had a, a lot uh, of, of those things going on already in your household. But what did that mean at this time when uh, even television okay. was not common to have in um, every house? At, at my youth time, the television was coming up, yes. But uh, if you say to go to opera, the question was which opera? Because we have the state opera and we have the Wiener Volksoper. And uh, these both possibilities were here. Uh, they were divided much more than in the serious part. Uh, uh, that means the big state opera and the small folks opera play, play, uh, playing uh, comedia, co playing operetta, playing easy, easy things. And what, what I want to explain that uh, you must imagine uh, Vienna as a, as a a place where you have many inhabitants of this Vienna. They all have abonnements. They have abonnements at this place or at that place. They like to go to opera. It's a, it's a place to meet friends, to discuss. And it's really funny because if you go, for instance, to a hairdresser uh, 20 years ago and you say you are, you are a musician, in the moment it changed, and in the moment a question, ah, where? Okay, this orchestra, ah, state opera, okay, what's going on there? Is this director okay or not? That is a very extraordinary situation because Vienna people are interested in this situation. And therefore, if a new opera director comes, it is such a political highlight for the people to speak about it and to say this is good, this is bad, to, to have the many possibilities, which singers and so on. This is the method how Viennese people are thinking about opera. And now at my time, I was uh, working for my, I told you, for my 30th uh, year uh, with my instrument, there was not so much time for me to go. But you were discussing and I heard very much around uh, the opinions also of my parents because we were discussing how, which <laughs> things are, how good, which quality they have. All this together, uh, I was interested in opera, but not so much as many colleagues of me. They say I was on the standing place on the Stehplatz in the opera and I heard several operas. This was not mine because these operas or these uh, concerts I heard, I met persons, they were working with my father at home. And therefore, it was a very private situation for me also, not the opera uh, on distance. And that is the interesting thing. And therefore, maybe it's better to ask uh, Johannes what he says about that yeah if i am asked i must say i grew up in the country in the mountains so for me it was not possible when i was 12 14 years it was not possible just to go to the opera we just heard about this and read in the newspaper when we had been born but to speak about this we have to have a small perspective in history what means theater what means uh, opera in Vienna and why does it mean that or this? Theater habits in Europe result from the same movement what the foundation of the United States result, the so-called Enlightenment. Without the Enlightenment, the United States would not have been founded in the way they have. 
and the Enlightenment made the United States to a leading institution in a new time. This is why we call it the new world, not only because Columbus found out that there was a new world, but the new world has also a new spirit. And this was the spirit of freedom, the spirit of enlightenment. And in Europe, enlightenment was transported by arts. Might be this is a little bit different to other parts of the world. Uh, the arts and the consumption of arts made the enlightenment uh, as a leading idea of Europe. And this is what today, if you look on the paper today or the television today, this is our problem that not the whole part of Europe has this movement of the Enlightenment. If you see Weimar, the city of Goethe, 200 years ago, you see in Weimar, Goethe was asked from the, uh, from the Duchess, Anne Amalia, uh, please construct a new theater. And this theater had 1,050 seats, this still, still uh, existing theater today. Why? Because Weimar had 1,050 citizens, and they went to the theater every night. So this was the transportation of ideas. And if we have today Vienna, I think there is no, uh, might be in New York, but for classical music, for classical theater opera, might be no other city, at least in Europe, no other city which so many seats. I don't speak about the opera houses. Uh, Michael Weber always said we have the many opera houses, at least three or four. Now um, three and four, yeah. Uh, three, oh, yeah. three big opera houses and uh, lots of theaters with opera, at the musical, all this. Um, but if you count the seats, so uh, Vienna is a city of 1.8 million inhabitants and we have each night about 6,000 seats to be seated which can have an opera. So that means today still uh, opera is not a divertisement. Opera is a medium for transportation of philosophy and lifestyle, life art, thinking and it is a child. It is a uh, uh, product product of the Enlightenment. And so uh, I remember uh, my, my first opera visit was when I was 12 or something like this. My parents took me to the Magic Flute. And uh, I know it was the second row on the balcony, seat number five. This was my first row in the Theater de Wien. So in these times, still there was in the Theater de Wien Magic Flute. And I uh, remember my father was incredibly uh, loving Erich Kunz. And in these years, uh, Erich Kunz was an uh, alternative uh, singer for the Papageno role with uh, Heinz Horicek. And uh, Till uh, my father died uh, 12 years ago, uh, in, the age of, in the age of 88, he complained that unfortunately, when I was the first time in the state, in the in the opera house in the Theater der Wien in Vienna, it was only Horicek and not Kunz. Uh, later on, I was a very good friend to Horicek, and he visited many of my performances. Uh, and uh, I always told him, can you imagine, you had been my first Papageno. So I had much, much less contact with opera than Michael Werber, but uh, you cannot imagine for a boy of, of, of 12, what this means to be in a desired place where you know this must be paradise on earth. And uh, now I'm almost in, in, in a couple of days, I'm 67 and still I have to say, Opera is the heaven on earth, not only for us in Vienna, but especially in Vienna. Fantastic. I would like to uh, echo uh, your, what your, your sentiment about uh, the importance of the Enlightenment in, in opera and political thought. Uh, I believe lately I saw some, uh, a little, read a little bit of scholarship, uh, I think by Annegret Fauser, the musicologist, saying that this is, uh, I believe, perhaps a reason why during the French Revolution they didn't destroy the opera because this had this, uh, this was actually kind of the catalyst of this uh, whole revolutionary thought and in individuality. Wonderful. Yes, Professor. May I say something? This is the, the, the bouncing point. Um, in old times, before the French Revolution, the opera was a symbol for 
uh, the upper classes. And this was the fantastic movement we know today. Goethe in, in Weimar was against the Enlightenment, but he was the engine to change the function of theater, to change the function also of the opera, uh, to bring it from an upper class spectacle to an all round spectacle for all society um, layers. And if you see, this is for me the most important uh, effect of Beethoven. Beethoven turns around the function, the social function of music for 180 degrees. Before Beethoven, we also could call it before Napoleon or whatever, before the Enlightenment, whatever you like. But before uh, Beethoven, the culture, music was in layers, upper class, middle class, uh, the, the, the church, uh, people of the church, uh, craftsmen, farmers, and each social layer had its own music and was bound, like today in India. You have the groups and you never will see that these groups merge. And now Beethoven comes and turns around. And after Beethoven, we have this enormous situation that the people's music, the folk music, comes together with the arts, with, with the so-called classical music, and there is no more separation. And this is the, the enormous power of Beethoven. We see it in Schubert. And I think this is the power of Vienna. And if we see today the uh, Vienna uh, concert halls and Vienna State Opera, Vienna Opera Houses, this comes from this movement uh, of the time of Beethoven that now music is not separating the layers, it's bringing together the layers. So uh, you have to imagine as after Beethoven, the emperor heard the same music as the workers in the brick factory. Incredible, if you think this 100 years ago, uh, 100 years before, in let's say 17, uh, 50, the time of Maria Theresia. Uh, but in 1850, after the revolution of 1848, it's clear we have all the same music. The society is connected by arts, not divided by arts. Fantastic. So we have a, a question, a comment by uh, John von der Fert. We're going to get to it, though, right after we take a look at some opera. Here is Beethoven's Fidelio, conducted by Leonard Bernstein. Fantastic. And let's take another look now at a, another. Uh, this is going to be now um, we're taking a look at uh, may op I, may op I only, operetta. Only yes, only yes. A moment, please. To, to this Fidelio Leonora overture, I picked it out uh, of YouTube because on because of two reasons. Uh, the first was uh, I was able to play in my use this production. <laughs> and for me, it was very interesting to uh, see this person, Leonard Bernstein, working in several functions, also in functions of a clown in a situation where the orchestra was very sad to have a rehearsal in a terrible room with a terrible acoustic in the Vienna State Opera. And he tried to make us happy and he was dancing in front of us and on the other side how serious he made this leonore dry overture and how is how much expression he, his person shows i didn't want to show it as an opera example but he's the person of bernstein is somebody who is really extraordinary and also you know the reopening at Wien after the new building was Fidelio and these both combinations therefore I picked it up excuse me I want yes. only so tell to tell you let's take a look uh, then at another opera example this is Verdi Otello yeah, yeah. okay and now we're going to take a look at operetta <laughs> Let's get back now to our conversation. And so I wanted to bring in, so we are going to be discussing next, what is operetta, what is opera? First, we have a question here 
uh, uh, we have a comment from John von der Fert, Kiri to Kanawa, wonderful choice. And John von der Fert writes a question. So opera was, is a social space as well as entertainment. It's a place of special community. Could you explain a bit more about this dynamic in Vienna, Professor Verba or Professor Wilke? Uh, if I'm asked, I would say um, it takes too long to describe this because then we are speaking till tomorrow morning, our time. Um, what's 12 hours uh, about this fact, but uh, we you will see, uh, Mr. Vanderwood, you will see all what we are discussing is around this double function. Uh, it's not only, it's also, uh, the, the, uh, it's good divertisement, it, it is, but it's always very deep inside the soul and inside the function, especially the Fidelio, what, what Michael showed. Uh, the Bernstein. Fidelio <clears throat> was an opera. Beethoven just wrote this one, this only opera, uh, on the border between absolutism and uh, the coming ideas of republic uh, thinking. Uh, 100 years uh, before the end of the Habsburg monarchy, but it was, might be, it was the most important uh, activity of an of an artist in a time of total depression and suppression in the Habsburg uh, uh, Empire on the first uh, century, second, uh, first decade, second decade of the 19th century. But then in 1955, uh, Vitellio was also, Michael uh, Weber mentioned it already, uh, was the first piece for the reopening of the Vienna State Opera. Now the Vienna State Opera was opened, reopened 10 years after it was destroyed. Why 10 years? Did Austria work that slow? Did Austria not like its opera? Did Vienna not like its opera? So that we did between the end of World War II, between the end of the National Socialist time in uh, summer, in, in, in springtime 1945, and the opening in uh, November uh, 1955 was more than uh, 10 and a half year. Why so long? Why? Because you will smile now or not, because Stalin died only on the 5th of March 1953. That means before Stalin died, People didn't like to refound, to recreate the Venus State Opera because the State Opera was a meeting point of social ideas and a meeting point of Venice people. And uh, nobody wanted to give uh, the undemocratic, Stalinistic uh, attitude ability to use the opera for its ideas. So. Interesting, it was 10, it was eight years that the ruins stood around there and everyone said, oh, this was our opera, unfortunately. It's not there. And in the moment when Stalin died, immediately all Vienna tried as quick as possible to rebuild the opera house. And that was from between the summer 1953, um, uh, the, the father of Michael Weber was just, uh, also, as a cultural journalist in these times, it's fantastic if you read his old um, uh, articles in uh, November 1955. And then Fidelio came, and you cannot imagine when we have uh, met old people which had been uh, taking part uh, in this uh, performance, it must have been incredible because uh, the souls of Austrians after national session, uh, after uh, 20 years of total devastating, 25 years, total devastating dictatorship, then the opera of freedom. And the same was in 1970. Uh, and I think Michael has to say much more about the meaning and the, about the function, social, historical and political function of these performances. Okay, so uh, first, uh, so this brings us uh, then rather- I, I would, I would, oh, excuse me. I want only to add him, uh, maybe the word Österreichischer Staatsvertrag 1955, Austria was free again. And they tried also, it was the same year we had the Österreichische Staatsvertrag to become freedom and the opera was finished. 
both situations at the same time they exploded and then playing this freedom opera uh video okay Just, I so uh everyone will have to make do with uh without a conversation about opera and operetta but we saw more or less what we're talking about when we speak about opera and operetta the opera is more serious more based on uh, the um, how do i say the more serious music the operetta a little bit light and popular and um, makes you smile so uh this we're going to then go to the centerpiece of our conversation what happened to the viennese music scene in 1946 in 19 in september of 1946 the courier newspaper a newspaper first published by the american military for viennese residents and today it has a daily circulation of 476,000 copies published an article with a curious headline. And this is my translation from the original German, quote, the Vienna State Opera to be divided. The article continues. In a press conference, director Juch spoke about the plans for a new season of the Volksoper. On September 1st began the divided operation of the Vienna State opera in theater on the Wien and the Vienna State Opera in the Volksoper. Only these, only, only the only thing these two theaters will have in common is the reinforced orchestra, the ballet, and the Vienna State Opera production equipment. The direction of each theater, on the other hand, the soloist, soloists, and the choir will be divided. The repertoire of the Volksoper will be traditional operas and the quote-unquote interesting operas, meaning the modern and seldomly performed. In that way, the competition between the two theaters will be eliminated. The traditional operas will be represented by repeat productions of Tannhäuser and an Italian opera like Aida or Unballo in Maschera, the quote-unquote interesting by Hindemith Matista Mahler and Richard Strauss' opera, most likely Die Schweigsame Frau, a Russian ballet <laughs> even including productions of Mussorgsky's Pictures and Exhibition and Stravinsky's Petrushka, and as classic operetta, a new production of Offenbach's Orpheus, directed by Willi Forst, end quote. So, professors, uh, tell us about the incredible post-war story of the Vienna State Opera and what you experienced as audience members of it and then performers in it. I think uh, we have to imagine, uh, to, to fulfill the rest we were discussing before, uh, that a town uh, at, at 1946, a town where the men were, were working or were in the war away from at home, uh, they, the politics saw it is necessary to bring up the public and they bring up the public that you have because of a destroyed opera house to different opera houses, but all playing opera. One at Theater in der Wien specialized in Mozart and Mozart operas, and one specialized in the so-called big operas and romantic operas. But you must think that is what uh, Johannes said before, how many seats you had you had a destroyed big opera house, and instead of that, you take now two houses that every one of the public is able to join opera performances. Therefore, you see how necessary the uh, opera playing was at this time. It is very interesting because uh, we spoke, uh, Johannes spoke about uh, 1.8 million people. Now think uh, this time a destroyed town, this, uh, the men outside of the town, and they needed two opera houses, and they were full. That, is, uh, that represents <clears throat> the, the thinking and the meaning at this time, and this very traditional Viennese music and art helps. Helps for the thoughts and for it makes positivism. And I think that is very interesting to explain. Okay, yeah. Professor yeah. Wilson. <laughs> yeah, uh, <clears throat> another idea, what we have uh, to think about this is here is uh, a couple of months before the end of the World War II, 
Richard Strauss wrote his uh, Metamorphosis for 23 strings. And you know, he did, he composed this piece because he said, I want to give something to the future what tells about my style, 23 solo strings, because I wrote so many pieces, opera pieces, symphony pieces with very big orchestra and stage. And Strauss wrote to the uh, introduction of this metamorphosis for 23 solo strings. I think opera performances in middle Europe after the war will not be possible for the next 200 to 300 years. Can you imagine the next 200 to 300 years? Now we have just about 70, 80 years after the war. For the next 200 to 300 years, Richard Strauss thought there will be no chance of open performance. And then three, two months, two months after the uh, uh, capitulation of the troops uh, in, in Berlin, after the end of World War II in the 8th, uh, in Moscow the 9th, the 8th of May, there was a Figaro in Salzburg Festival, Vienna Philharmonic playing and the so-called Vienna Mozart Ensemble. So all Europe was damaged totally and what stayed, what remained, Figaro, Mozart and this for us Austrians, you please apologize uh, this 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 uh, idea for us Austrians this is a very important moment because in 1938 we lost our independence uh, in, as a state. We had been swallowed and still today, if we come somewhere in Europe and we speak German, even if we do it in a really bad Austrian way, because it's very lazy how we speak. But uh, the first question is, are you German? So, no, no, no uh, I'm Austrian. Uh, so this is something what is very important. But then uh, in, uh, in 1938, this country was away. We had been Germans, part of the big German empire. And if you now see, is there any difference between Austria and the German? It is not only between Austria and the Germans, but also inside Germany. You never can compare. And what is the, you never can compare people from the north with people from Bavaria, people from Saxonia with people from, from uh, Württemberg or what else. So what is the difference? The difference is in the cultural profile. And for us Austrians, for us Austrians, I hope I speak also in your sense, Michael. Uh, it's our culture and it's the culture of Beethoven, of Grillparzer. Beethoven was born in Germany, but he formed the Austrian way of thinking. Grillparzer, Richard Strauss also came from Bavaria, but they formed an Austrian idea of cultural uh, decision to be in a community. And so, uh, for us in Austria, the rebirth of Austria was not the end of World War II, but the rebirth of the idea was we have the chance to reproduce our own culture now. So for me, especially uh, privately for me, but I, I think for many people, the Salzburg Festival in 1945, just two days or three days and two performances of Figaro was the crucial point. This nation is existing as a nation. It's not an idea of a state, but it's a nation. Uh, and therefore it was so important that now uh, it, uh, the people came home from the war, many people are refugees and, 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 and uh, now they came home and said, we play opera again. Where we play, it's not important. The opera is broken. Yes, we have one part of the opera we do in the Theater de Wien. We can repair it in two weeks. And the other is the Folks Opera. And there was a third very small stage uh, with, with just a very small orchestra in the in, in, in one part was what, what was not destroyed in the Viennese Hofburg in the in the Royal Castle. Uh, so it was not important where in which building it was, but it was important that there was a performance. The curtain went up and the cultural profile of a nation re 
was reborn, was born again after this disaster. Okay, fantastic. And Professor Verba, so uh, I want to show you a recording that you asked to be showed of Leonard Bernstein, whom, with whom you worked. And uh, I'd like you to tell us about this, uh, why you chose this, please. Warten, warten. Ich werde ihn geben. Haben Sie dich in diesem Tag äh, 76, also Sie haben nicht äh, teilgenommen. Well, Professor, why uh, did you choose that? And uh, tell us about this. Uh, uh, can you bring this into this whole uh, experience of yes. Vienna uh, 19? This, uh, this is a very difficult thing because you must imagine, after the war, Vienna was in a very difficult situation. I uh, heard it from my parents much later. Nobody spoke about that. You had, uh, you had persons, you had half of the person were a little bit thinking Nazi-like positivism, and the rest was uh, Jewish, who was here and the Jewish were coming back. And my parents, for instance, told me, look, you had these both sides, but if you are not one of them, it's very difficult to make for you to make your way. Your way in, in like my father, it was uh, to become an international person. And what I want to show at this place was and this Johannes, I think, can help us a little bit because it's interesting. We had also members of Vienna Philharmonic. They were leading the Vienna Philharmonic at this time. And these persons tried to bring Bernstein to Vienna in this time. And Bernstein was now teaching the Vienna Philharmonic what is Mahler and how he likes Mahler to play. And it was twice. Uh, I think there were about uh, six or eight years between twice Bernstein in Vienna with Mahler Symphony. And the first time it was really so difficult for the orchestra. At first, the person of Bernstein. Uh, if he is making a show in conducting, or he feels it really, and therefore I wanted to show his, this uh, video, because here you can see how he feels this music. And on the other side, he was the right person to make, to make the uh, bridge between several uh, different, uh, different thoughts of the public and of the uh, of the musicians at this time. Please, uh, Johannes, we spoke. Uh, you told me, I think we can speak this in this uh, connection, uh, how Bernstein was asked uh, coming to Vienna. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I also think Bernstein was a crucial point, a very, very important point in Vienna development. When I was a young boy, uh, I remember in the orchestra, people didn't, some of the people didn't like to play the compositions by Mahler because uh, uh, people thought uh, this is uh, music written by a crazy conductor, so nobody has to play this, nobody has to hear this. Uh, it is like I would try to make an example with Carol. Carrots, they have lots of vitamin B, as we know, and are healthy. But our body doesn't 
reflect on these uh, masses of vitamin B of these amounts because we cannot get it. So the only way how we can get the vitamin B out of the carrots is we cook, the, not cook, but we uh, boil, very, very softly cook, I don't know the English word, in oil. And now the vitamin B comes out of the carrots in the oil. And then we make some risotto or whatever else. And now the oil with the vitamin B is in the risotto or in the pasta or whatever, in the salad. And now we can get the vitamins, vitamins, not directly from the carrot, but in the transmission. And so I would say Leonard Bernstein was the transmission oil for the spiritual vitamins of Gustav Mahler. Gustav Mahler was not understood in the place where he was born and where he grew to one of the world's most important composers. Uh, I would say uh, one of the uh, early quotations of Mahler was, uh, I think he wrote it in a letter to Nathalie Bauer Lechner, a soprano he admired very much. That, uh, writing a symphony means to create an own world with my own skills and tools. And this is what I do. So I think Mahler wrote one symphony and uh, he separated each hour. He made a new number. But you have always to see the symphonies by Mahler in one from the first note of the first might be earlier of the Clarity lead till the last note of the never composed 10th. Uh, and uh, at least an uh, adagio from the 10th. So you have always to see this is a cosmos. Now, Bernstein, he knew incredible many emotional details about the music of Mahler because I think it was some. Uh, brothership, some uh, feeling, a bridge from one genius to the other. So he saw that Mahler described between, uh, when was the first symphony, 1887 in uh, Hungary, 89, first performance in Budapest, and uh, he died in 19. 11, so it was not a long time, it was 20, actually 24 years of composing, and in these 24 years, for, uh, one fourth of a century, um, he saw, like a man who is looking into the future, he saw the disaster of the Jewish people in the 20th century caused by the Holocaust. And he also saw that this disaster is not a disaster of the Jewish people, it's a disaster of the world. This world can create such a feeling, such things people are able to think, to do, and on the end, and this is the message of the Seventh Symphony and might be also the message of the First Symphony and parts of the Eighth Symphony. This disaster can also be survived by mankind. Might be this was the most astonishing uh, view of, of Gustav Mahler that if we think uh, on, the, on the end of the Sixth Symphony, you cannot stand this, you cannot, the, the world ends, the world cannot be uh, existing anymore. Uh, and all this, he wrote, two generations before it happened, at least one, one and a half generation, uh, generations before it happened. But uh, if we see on the end of the 16th century, <coughs> world is not more existing, cannot exist anymore, then in the seventh we see it can. It is not the same as it was before. As we are not the same, uh, if we have a serious illness, uh, after this we change. Some things change in our body. Many things change in our mind. We call it heart or soul or whatever in our personality. But this was the description of Mahler. Now Bernstein was brought to Vienna by 
uh, leader of the Vienna Philharmonic, an or organizational leader, uh, Mr. Wubisch, who was absolutely before 1945, unfortunately dedicated to uh, the national um, socialistic uh, regime. Uh, now, a member of the uh, of these people around the National Socialists. Now he goes and picks up Bernstein to come to Vienna. Why? Because he was clever enough to see this man has an aura, has a extreme strong personality. And this man can help us, can help not only Vienna, not only Austria, the so-called old world. This man can help us to read our own history. And this he read in the books, in the scores by Gustav Mahler. And this man is our key what we have to use to open the door to this part of our past, what we have to solve to have a future. And uh, if we see it now, uh, Bernstein died in 1990, Wubisch died, I think, uh, <clears throat> about seven or eight years before, might be 82, I, I, I can't remember exactly. Uh, so this is, again, uh, one generation ago, but I think it's our duty to keep the uh, rememberings, the, to, to remind these things and to keep it alive in our brains, in the brains of the next generation, and also worldwide in the uh, feelings, in the emotions of the audiences, of the friends, of culture, friends of music, friends of civilization, to uh, remind uh, this was Bernstein, definitely a genius. Uh, uh, and he opened us with help of Mara, our future. Definitely Bernstein was a genius. I hope you agree, uh, Michael. Uh, um, uh, with my pupils, uh, I'm teaching, conducting in the Vienna University, and with my pupils, I have often discussions about tempo, because I think tempo is not done by the conductor, tempo is done by the composer, and we are just, uh, we have to keep the tempo what uh, the conductor composed, and not what we like to do. This is an arrogancy of many conductors that go, oh, I make the tempo, no, it's not, no, it's not, not serious. But <laughs> Bernstein, for instance, uh, made extremely sometimes extremely slow tempi. Now I remember and, and many pupils come and say, ah, can you look once on the slow movement on the third movement of the second uh, symphony by Schumann? Ah, how Bernstein does. Uh, it's much too slow and it's not what Schumann writes. And this is the, I remember I played in this film what you saw when you saw the third movement of the second symphony by Schumann. But uh, if you do this tempo, it's wrong. But if Bernstein did this tempo, it was Bernstein Schumann. And you don't have to judge it. Just enjoy the power, the enormous strength of these ideas and just lift your head and say, fantastic. I heard the CD or I saw the film where one genius is having coffee with another genius. And so this is interpretation. We can measure everything. We can say this is right, this is wrong. But in arts, there is only one thing right. The one thing what brings the idea to the heart of the audience and to the spirit, to the spirit, to the brains of the audience. And if we fulfill this demand, then it's art and otherwise it's fake okay so i would like to um, um move on and then i believe professor uh, dr D davis has a question i just want to move on to the last uh, question quickly then um looking back and looking forward professor verba professor wildner 
what do you what do you feel when you look back and you say you saw this, you lived through this incredible, um, well, first this, uh, you're too young to have lived through the destruction, but you lived through this, as Professor Verba said, it was this destruction and all this about what happened we, it was not to be talked about in the family, but you knew that something bad happened and you lived through this there's a rebuilding of of everything. What do you what do you feel when you look back at all this? And then what do you feel when you look forward? Maybe we start with you, Professor Wildman. Uh, I think uh, Michael wanted to say uh, to add some ideas, and David for seven and one wanted to discuss something. Did, did I see this right? No, David, please. David to Davis. Oh, uh, okay. Davis. Sorry, Davis, <laughs> Jerry Davis. Thank you very much, both of you very very interesting discussion just wanted to point out uh many years ago i spent uh, five years in lausanne switzerland and during that time i was a student there and during those times i hitchhiked to vienna one time because uh, my grandparents came from vienna and when i was in vienna i went to the opera and i paid 25 cents for standing room only. And I saw the Rosen Cavalier was fantastic. And thank you again, both of you. Thanks, uh, uh, Also to, to, to say that standing places are as cheap in the relation, as cheap as they were before. We, we were very fighting that they are not going up because every opera director wants to bring them up or to say instead of the standing places we make seats and then I can earn more money and we are very happy that we have the standing places yeah, Thank yeah you. It's also was interesting the uh, the acoustic where the standing places are are the best acoustic in Vienna State <laughs> yeah, the first row, if you go to the first row, it's incredible, really. And I'm sitting, if I go now to the opera, I'm sitting one row before the standing places. This is the best acoustic. And we like, you, you hear, we like opera because it gives so much uh, energy to you because every singer if he has the quality and it's not only the quality of the voice it's the quality of the person like we saw now bernstein working uh, if they have so much strength to bring together the public then you are happy and then you are glad to be a member if playing or as a public of this situation that I wanted also to say at the end of this uh, of these very interesting ideas. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you. I, and John Fonderfeld, he writes uh, as a review of opera. I would say too that you can't lie with opera. So, um, uh, final thoughts then, uh, Professor Wildner. Uh, yeah, uh, the historic uh, roots for the standing room. Uh, Mr. Davis, I'm happy about you said about the standing rooms, and Michael said it's still very cheap. Uh, you know, 200 years ago or 300, 200 years ago, uh, people didn't sit in the opera. This is this was a, a result of the Enlightenment, actually, because in early times only the emperor and his wife could sit, have seats, could sit down on seats, and all other people around had to stand. You know, this is the, the reason also for the English expression for the chairman, uh, because the chairman was the only one who was allowed to sit near the, near the king, because the king shouldn't look up to the men speaking to him. So all people around the king had to stand, but nobody was allowed to sit. Uh, uh, when the, if, if the king sits here on the throne, all other people must stand. But the one he's speaking, the one who is speaking, the speaker, he must sit down. Otherwise, the king has to look up. And this is not polite. So he has to have the face of the same high or might be even lower. And this is the reason why the speaker sits on a chair. And so he's the chairman. Uh, I think it's a very beautiful expression. Unfortunately, we don't uh, have this in German. But uh, now, 
uh, with the Enlightenment, uh, opera was not only for the emperor and the nobleman, all people came. So everybody wanted to be an emperor and everybody took chairs and took a seat. Uh, but then came a social uh, idea. Let's have places for standing for the Vienna State Opera has, I think, 1,000 600, uh, 550, 1,600 seats, plus 750 standing rooms. And they uh, really, uh, Michael, do you know how, uh, I think they are 1 euro 50 or 2 euro 50 or something? Yeah, yeah, like that. I think yeah. under under three euro, uh, three euro fifty. I think under five yeah. euro and five so, euro. Uh, Forty centimeters between the last row of the uh, seats and the first row of the standing places are uh, the difference between one hundred and fifty euros and three euros fifty, <laughs> and this is uh, very important because this is why I remember uh, my daughter. Uh, she's uh, working as a stage director in the moment, and my daughter had time, had had uh, periods in her life where she was in the opera six times a week. Six times a week she went to the Vienna State Opera. Why only six times? Because one evening she had to go to the concert. Fantastic. So thank you so much. Let's see how we can stay in touch with Professor Verba. Here is the webpage at the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra. We can see it right here. And Professor, yes. can, how can uh, people can reach out to you uh, to ask you questions or to uh, make, and, make comments? And please look to the opera of the Entführer of the Serail. It's really a very nice production we had. Okay, fantastic. So I will uh, put that here in the chat room. So that was, you can reach out to Professor Verba and let's see how we can stay in touch then with Professor Wiltner. Just visit me on my homepage. Um, I could my my email is uh, I write it in the chat. Is this okay? Mm -hmm, sure. So here it's johanneswildner.com and you can see Professor. Uh, wait a bit. There is a web page. I hope it, Johannes, it, you, is it correct? Yeah, it's correct. It is. Perfect. So uh, is Professor just, uh, 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 reach out to uh, him? Answers, answers could take two or three weeks uh, when I'm traveling mm -hmm. around or whatever. But uh, I'm happy about each question, about each suggestion. And uh, I learned a lot uh, of things today. Uh, thank you, Simeon, for having this discussion. Thank you, Michael, for bringing me to Simeon. And thank you all for the wonderful feeling that we offer something in Vienna what makes the world what is not in a good shape in the moment, what makes the world uh, easier, better yeah, and yeah. more worthy to all uh, human beings. Uh, just because we didn't touch about the operetta, don't separate opera and operetta. It's theater music, it's music what is a dramatical uh, attempt to bring real life into the souls and it gives a chance Every, what we, everything what we see is fantasy and fantasy makes the world go round and fantasy might be this is the uh, the message by bernstein nothing without imagination okay and uh, in this sense i was very happy in the last hour fantastic now. thank you so much to you uh, professor v johannes wildner and professor michael verba thank you very much thank so, you invitation bye bye let, let's take a look at what's coming next week we have here mark smutney radically inclusive business meetings are some people more intelligent than others if so should their thoughts be more seriously considered at business okay. meetings i say yes and no the okay. new universal consensus among Western management scholars is that, by definition, managers should have more intelligence available to them than any other employee of an organization. It's upon that intelligence collection that managers should base their decisions. And the quote-unquote no part? Managers are in no way more intelligent than other employees, except, hopefully, concerning aspects of their own management domain. That's why Mark Smutney's concept of radically inclusive business meetings is so powerful. Presumably, every NVT has been invited to bring their intelligence to a meeting, that is, proprietary intelligence 
presided over by no other meeting participant and sh to share it to the benefit of all others. But in practice, that doesn't happen very often. It's more common that one or two participants speak while all others, for a myriad of reasons, keep silence, uh, silently keep their intelligence to themselves. Of course, when it's break time, everyone goes outside and boisterously talks about what's not being shared at the meeting. Mark Smutney, author of Thrive, The Facilitator's Guide to Radically Inclusive Meetings, now published in its second edition, joins us to present his step-by-step -step guide to unleashing the power of radically inclusive business meetings. That's next week, next Wednesday. As always, all information about upcoming shows may be found at www.simeonmorrow.com. That's Mark Smutney, Radically Inclusive Business Meetings. I'd also like to point out that if you go just below that, you'll get an interesting uh, interview that I did with the trumpet accordion duo, Eric and Will. That's at simeonmorrow.com. Once again, thank you so very much to professors uh, Mikhail Verba and Johannes Wilsner. Thank you very much to Professor Lino Rivera of, of St. Mary's College of California, to Benoit and Agnieszka Rivole for their support of the show. Most of all, thanks to you, our participants who make it all worthwhile. From Vienna, Austria, New London, New Hampshire, in the Bay Area, California, goodbye, and see you next Wednesday.